Eric, are you, have you caught your breath? Are you ready to? I, thank you, Stacy. you're so kind. Thank you, yeah. It is a bit of breath catching these days, so thank you. Yeah, so I don't have any slides prepared, but I don't think I need them. I'm just gonna go ahead and just speak directly to the topic that Larry asked me to speak on. So uh, this story starts with me transitioning from working with actually John Boultry at Neomed to uh, Ohio State University. Hey, John. Um, and in that transition, um, I was inspired by the work of Art Coffin because I had been working with Art um, and some projects when I was at Neomed. Um, and in fact, we brought some of the work that he was doing in, 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 um, in New Mexico, like for example, this thing called Project Echo, which some of you may have heard of, to Ohio, but with a particular focus on youth. Um, and so as I transitioned to Ohio State into, into a department, the Department of Human Sciences, which is focused on the social determinants of health, we have four program areas, and they are human nutrition, kinesiology, human development and family sciences, and um, consumer sciences, which I like to say are the basic ingredients of health. It's what you eat, how you move, how you relate to others, and how you manage your resources, which we know are all the social determinants of health. As I transitioned, I, um, I started looking at extension as a possible partner for reaching out into community to work with and identify and work with youth who have any kind of interest whatsoever in the space of community health and or health professions um, to see if those existing folks that are located in the community that have deep ties to the community like think through things like 4-H um, could possibly be allies in this. And I also have six faculty in my department. Um, we have a faculty of 54 tenure track faculty, about, about, about 70 full-time faculty in total. Six of them had extension appointments. So I, as a chair, I had to get to know all of that and become a part of that. Um, I also became connected with this other group called the Association for Public and Land Grant Universities, which is the biggest national organization for public and land grant universities in, in the country. And they have a decided focus on extension. And in fact, the, the organizing, the national organizing body for extension situates within the APLU as it's referred to. And that, that organizing body is called the Extension Committee on Policy. So I started getting involved in all of that and learned more about extension and got more excited. Um, you know, extension has really deep roots in our country. Uh, it goes all the way back to the founding of land grant universities like Penn State, Ohio State, and so on. Um, and, uh, and it really was initially focused on positioning the assets of universities in communities to advance agriculture, which was the dominant industry uh, in the 1800s and continues to be a dominant industry for us as a nation. Uh, and the idea was simple. Could we position folks in the community to share with the community scientific innovations in the space of agriculture that could then be translated into actual changes in farming practice? And concurrently, could these same people be actively working with farmers to identify pressing emerging problems that they're facing? aggregate those problems and bring them back to the university so that the scientists could actually then know what they are and study them and provide solutions. There's this wonderful continuous quality improvement process focused on, on ag. Well, over the years, extension evolved and now there's multiple divisions of extension and one of those divisions is called family and consumer sciences. It has its roots in home economics. And if you think about home economics and you think about the health of communities, we know that a primary context for health is the family. That's why I love working with family docs because you guys get it. <laughs> um, and if we think about who's the primary health care provider in the family, historically it was mom and dad, and it still is largely today. And home economics really was about empowering people in homes to better manage their homes, care for their families and advance their families and their interests. So extension evolved to include a decided focus on that because they saw that as a strategic priority for the nation because healthy families breed healthy people who become more productive workers, which have a bigger impact on the, on the, on the economy and advance us as a whole from a health and wellness point of view. So um, it's departments like mine that emerged out of home economics. Um, and so that said, the question then became, well, what can extension do more so in the space of health? And for about a couple decades now, extension has increasingly placed a decided focus on health. 
Um, and so as I became involved with the APLU, I started learning all of this. And, you know, naturally I'd been in medicine, medical education for a decade. So I was like really interested and particularly from the point of view of how primary health care is changing towards health and wellness care. Um, and so as I continue to get involved in that, I ended up becoming part, I was asked to be a part of a group called this Health Innovation Task Force for Extension. And, uh, and the aim of that task force was to try to understand what are the pressing issues around the nation? How can they attach to extension? And how can extension be a more vital role, play a more vital role in all of that? And so uh, there were like 16 or 17 ideas that were pitched within the task force. And uh, one of them was one that I had pitched, which was around how can we position extension in partnership with three primary community domains? The first domain is health and health community health care. The second is educational attainment and progress. And the third is economic prosperity. So when you think about communities, these three circles exist. There are, there are partners within communities that represent these three circles. And to the extent that these three circles interact in positive ways, it creates virtuous cycles where communities get healthier, they, be, they become more educated, they get more jobs, those jobs breed prosperity, which feeds right back into health and education. And they also breed vicious cycles, just the opposite of what I've described. So the idea was, what, could if, what, if, what, what if we could create a system whereby extension serves as a hub in communities, bringing together educational, health, and economic prosperity interests with a decided focus on empowering communities to be engaged in their health as they're advancing themselves in the health professions. But not just the narrow range of health professions we all think about, like medicine, pharmacy, nursing, allied health, but a broader array of professions as well, um, because we know there's other professions like, for example, nutrition, dietetics, um, exercise science, these kinds of things that play into true wellness care. Um, and how could that become part of the equation as well, which would also then open up more opportunities for success for communities, because we know that the road to medicine is long and hard and expensive, despite all of our efforts to change it. And so while we all wish to make it less difficult for certain groups to achieve and make it less expensive for certain groups to get through, we have systems problems there that we still need to work on. So in the meantime, how can we have other educational pathways with as little as a high school diploma or an associate's degree or a college degree that would position people into good paying jobs, devoted to health, composed of people for and from disadvantaged communities. So that was the big idea that was pitched. And of the 16 or so ideas, two were selected. The first was to, um, was to advance, to update a health innovation framework that Extension had written in 2014. And so there's a group now developing a, a new version of that framework for Extension. And then the other group was the one I described around these three domains and called it the big idea. Um, and as a consequence of that, there was a work group form that I now chair on this topic. And we're now actively seeking partners. We're looking for partners all over the country that are either at the national level who have a, interests allied with community health in the way I described it, you know, a business community and to the extent that they wanna play in and they understand that how value affects their bottom line K-12 education, higher education, they playing a more active role in underrepresented communities. And so we now are at the stage where we're cultivating partnerships. Happy to report that the FMEC is a partner. Uh, Larry Bauer is actually on our advisory committee. Um, Ashley Bentley uh, and the AAFP is now a partner. And we're right now still in that phase of identifying partners. So uh, we have, for example, now as a partner, HRSA, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, we have um, the CDC, multiple people there. Um, there's a growing list, I could keep going, there's a growing list, there's about 20 partners now, and we're looking to move towards having a convening, a virtual convening, um, sometime in June. We just actually changed from April to June because we have so many partners coming forward. We want to have time to really cultivate partnerships first. And it's going to be what's called an unmeeting. And the way an unmeeting works is really fun. Basically what you do is you have a couple of high level speakers who frame the event. And then the lion's share of the event are attendees moving in between small groups 
with some very structured but general questions that gets from the audience their perspectives on the issues of education, health, and economic vitality, how they interrelate, what are real programs that are currently occurring in community that should be a part of our model. Uh, and, and organically, what ends up happening is you end up developing themes that then speak to what a framework for this might look like. The outcome of the unmeeting will be the start of an alliance at the national level, where we'll have state, well, sorry, we'll have national um, interests that will be supporting partners, and we'll have hopefully two or three or four states that are willing to be pilots. Um, and in each state, naturally, extension would be involved, um, but it would also be the land grant universities, perhaps other universities. It would be healthcare interests. It would be community interests and it certainly would be educational interests. And the idea would be that we would develop a framework that would be flexibly applied within states with again, extension being a new feature for some of you at the table, um, with the idea being how can we use existing assets in communities to advance these interests that we have in the health professions, community health and economic prosperity. So I know I've spoken a ton, I can answer questions. I've given you a very broad overview of what this big idea is. It's still in definitely the formative stage. Um, we are moving forward in Ohio, uh, actually partnering with Larry. I mentioned this to Ted the other day uh, to convene stakeholders. Our director of extension signed on. Our, our, one of our associate deans in pharmacy has signed on and nursing has signed on. So we're gonna be bringing together stakeholders to basically be sort of that leading edge of what's coming at this national level. So Eric, uh, quick question. Are you hoping to uh, evolve existing extension services or are you creating a brand new extension service model? Right, it's an, it's an evolution. So we would like to focus in on those elements of extension that are most aligned. The ones that really jump out right now are 4-H. And for those of you who don't know, the 4-Hs are head, heart, hands, are you ready for it? Health. And yet it's that fourth H that doesn't get emphasized as much and it's an extension recognizes this and says, we've got to figure out a way to emphasize the health and 4-H more so. And then the other element of extension that really jumps out is the family and consumer sciences side because of their decided focus on the social determinants of health, even though they don't talk about it in those terms. Uh, and, and just a real quick side note on extension, very well funded, hundreds of millions of dollars every year coming from the federal government to the states, deep, deep, deep legacy, deep, deep ties to community, um, and very well respected in a, in a large share, particularly of our rural communities. They're, one of their pain points is being more relevant in urban communities. And Eric, how is that uh, partnered or affiliated with the HOSA programs? Is there a connection there? I'm trying to figure out how those things are. I'm not aware of, I, I'm familiar with HOSA. Actually, I think it was Larry who introduced me to HOSA. Um, I'm not aware of a, of a tie there, but your question is a great illustration of the point, which is, you know, there isn't a deficit of pipeline programs. Every medical school, virtually every nursing school, every pharmacy school has them. Um, the inherent weakness with the, the pipeline programs is they usually hinge on a tenuous funding source and they also hinge on a personality who really cares about it. HOSA is a rare example of a very long sustained pipeline program. The real issue though is how can we stitch these programs together in a more sustainable way? And again, extension services are clearly sustainable, at least in the foreseeable future. Yeah, and my other question, Eric, is about... Uh... GME. So, you know, if somebody were, for example, rewriting family medicine residency requirements um, that include more closely close affiliation to communities, you know, that what you're describing is is remarkable resources through the extension program. And I have a family of 4-H kids, so I'm very familiar. But um, and I think you're right. The health is not always the focus of what they do. Um, so if I were to write a requirement 
for every residency to get involved in the community in some way that would not only improve the health of the community, but help the pipeline a bit. Like, what would that look like? How do you see that playing out? And, and you mentioned a lot of partners, but I didn't hear ACGME in that list or... Um, Certainly a partner, right? Certainly a partner, Stacy. absolutely. Um, so just as a little bit more about extension. Um, with extension service, uh, I'll give you Ohio as the example. Um, extension is, is physically located with offices and personnel in all 88 counties in Ohio. And so imagine now, you know, you're a medical college in the state and you want to have engagement to the extent you can in all 88 counties. How are you gonna do that with the resources that exist in a medical college, particularly those resources that are allocated to things like recruitment and, um, and, and, and pipeline programs, which is usually quite modest. Um, and so I, I, I see tremendous potential there, especially, especially in the vein of medical schools who have a decided interest in a couple areas. The first is truly community engaged health. Um, extension service personnel are deeply tied to many facets of their community that they're, they're hubs, they're, they're connectors, kind of like Larry, they're connectors, that's what they do. Um, they, they are known and they know many of the community brokers. Um, they're in the schools, uh, particularly on the family and consumer sciences side, delivering curriculum that many in medicine aren't even aware of, but deeply ties to the social determinants of health. They're, de they're developing curriculum on financial wellness. They're developing curriculum on how to eat right and what not to eat. They're developing curriculum on, you know, uh, for example, you know, moving better and more. Um, this is happening and it's been happening for years, but from what I can tell, it's largely been happening in a way that's disconnected from the health professions. So the hope is that at least in more progressive leaning extension services, that when they come to realize that what they're doing is treasured by at least certain folks in medicine and respected in medicine, that it could develop alliances like, for example, in the, in the GME space. Um, and, I, and I think about you know, the work that Ted's doing, for example, in Ohio, garnering resources to hire folks um, in the training phases to do this work. Um, you know, it's these kinds of things that I think we need to stitch more together with people like Extension that's embedded in communities already. It's just a, just a reaction. It was a great question, Stacey. Hey, Eric, this is Judd uh, Mellinger Block from the Pennsylvania Primary Care Career Center. Um, and I'm, I'm currently the president of the National Rural Recruitment and Retention Network, or 3RNet. And this is, sounds like something we'd be really interested in hearing more about. Um, but also, uh, Molly and I have been working with some other folks, our state office of rural health, and some other folks on some uh, on reinventing rural recruitment here in Penn State, Pennsylvania. And I, I'm a Penn Stater myself. Uh, the fact that you're at Ohio State, I'm, I'm dealing with that. But um, uh, but uh, but I, my dad was an ag teacher, and so I, I know the extent of the Penn State of the Penn State extension that the reach it has. Um, and I just hadn't even thought about that before. And, I know Ted was talking earlier about getting uh, uh, physicians to identify uh, promising young people who, who are well aware of, uh, who, who, who might have a future in, in, a, in a healthcare profession, but veterinarians would also have that insight. Now they might be wanting to steer people towards veterinarian school, but they certainly, you know, and I think oftentimes at, uh, rural kids are under, that they, they don't get the credit that do the, the, the the responsibility it takes and the knowledge of science and animal husbandry and so forth to raise a prize steer or to raise to raise a, a flock of chickens um, is just amazing. And um, I'm just, I, this has really set my mind uh, a, a lot of creativity coming out of this. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd like well, you're to- You're welcome. If, if, you're, if you'd be interested in having a one-on-one -on -one conversation about how your organization 3RNet, which I've heard of, and you, you do great work uh, to be a partner within the national alliance that we're developing. We would welcome to have at least the conversation right. with you. Certainly we're an inclusive bunch, the more the merrier at this point. It's right. all about Good. bringing folks to the table. And I'll just also add Penn State alum, got my PhD there. Um, so I'm okay in your book, I guess. Okay. Yeah, um, right. And uh, um, and, uh, and, and uh, I also am um, colleagues with the Dean of Admissions at the Hershey, Hershey Medical School, uh, Dwight oh, Davis. Very good. Thanks, mm -hmm. Eric. I'll be mm -hmm. in touch. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are at a school where you're like, well, we don't have an extension service. 
something I would just emphasize is the Ohio State Extension, its aim is not to serve Ohio State. Its aim is to serve the communities and there's structural things in place to make it so. And so uh, something to consider is, is if you're at a, any kind of school in any state, every state has an extension service. This model could be applicable to you too. So just a follow up on that, Eric, when we were talking with Dennis, uh, Ted, you and I uh, last week, when this was brought out to Dennis, who's been at Penn State for like ever, uh, he was delivered by Tom Lehman, the chair of family medicine. He's been there forever. <laughs> he had no clue that there was an extension service at Penn State. But I, I'll yeah, bet he does. Probably in every county in Pennsylvania too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I saw in the chat, Ashley said there's some, there was a question about double AMC data. Um, working on a different project that I can talk about just briefly, which is we're using about 5.4 million rows of data from double AMC to figure out what's happening in recruitment, admissions, and matriculation with a focus on diversity, which I think would attach to the comments of the colleague that just mentioned about rural. But was there a particular question, Ashley, that I that was, that was asked? Actually, my question, Eric, and the question was, do we know for underrepresented minorities, um, how do they compare in terms of going into family medicine and true primary care, how do mm -hmm. they compare to uh, the rest, to their classmates? Yeah, they're higher. Um, there's a slight, there's a slight a higher incidence of underrepresented minorities going into, uh, into primary care um, than, than the other specialties. And there's, there's probably a, a complex mix of reasons for that, um, some of which tie to um, what I'll just say is a misuse of step one scores in residency um, selection. That's part of it because it attaches to standardized tests and we know there's a bias in standardized tests against certain groups, but part of it also just attaches to interests so in this study that I, we're working on right now, here's what we're finding. We're finding that when a medical school asserts a mission that is a combination of primary care, medically underserved, diversity, and social interests, when there's more of that present in the mission statement of the medical school, they enjoy appreciably more applications from underrepresented uh, minority, racial minority students. Um, as do uh, those medical schools also enjoy more, more higher percentage of applications from students who are economically disadvantaged. Um, and what the, what the research we're, we're just now working on right now for publication suggests that those early applicant pools are a huge set point for what happens beyond that. Certainly holistic review in admissions can move that set point, but that set point's pretty powerful. And I'll just also say, we're all, our data also show huge variability in the percentage of URM applicants across medical schools. So there are some medical schools for which that percentage of URM in the total applicant pool is in the range of one to 3%. I can give you the exact point estimate if, if you want it, but it's in the range of one for 3%, whereas other medical schools, that percentage is 18 or 19%. Wow. Imagine that difference. If you're an admissions committee trying to figure out how are you going to advance diversity, uh, racial diversity in your medical school, when you've got one school with two or 3% of the pool as that way, and another school where it's 17 or 18%. That is a tremendous set point for everything that follows. Holistic review can only do so much if 2% of your pool is an underrepresented minority. Likewise, you don't need much holistic review at all if 18% of your pool is an underrepresented minority. And I, I heard this shocking statistic recently that um, there's less black men applying to medical school now than 30 or 40 years ago, which like is just shocking, but also just unconscionable and thinking about you know, the work that needs to happen to undo that. And I think this Black Men in White Coats organization and, and movement should, you know, hopefully will help with some of that, but it's just, it's uh, unbelievable. So I'll just quote that specific statistic. So if we look specifically at URM male students 
who assert that they have a personal disadvantage. This is part of the application process. You say whether you feel you're disadvantaged or not. The national rate of that group in the pool is 2.9%. There are some medical schools for which that rate is 6.6%. And there are other medical schools for which that rate is 7% of their applicant pool. So recruitment matters and yep. mission matters. So Stacy, should we take a break? Yeah, so thank you, Eric, for that. I really appreciate all of that information and all the great work you're doing. Um, and so what I would recommend is that we take our break now and then return probably just, maybe just return at five or a couple minutes before five for our, our next set of speakers. Sound good? So the next the next set will be Molly and Judd. Okay. Great. Um, hey, Larry, um, yeah. if, if, do you have screen share open? Yeah. Okay. Well, while people are on break, I'll put up a slide from the research we're doing that, that shows all the numbers for all the various combinations of demographics, just so you can see how big the spread is for medical schools. It's pretty remarkable. I'll do that right now. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see that, but I can make it a little bigger. So just for those who are still on the line, um, the, the, the X in the middle of the line represents the national rate for those different groups. And then the numbers on the outside of the lines represent the minimum and the maximum for any medical school in the nation. And then the top line for each graphic is the admission pool, I'm sorry, the applicant pool. And the bottom line represents the admit pool. In fact, I can actually show you something one better. This is applications, admissions, and matriculation, who actually comes to medical school and you'll see how big the spreads are. <clears throat> Eric, this is impressive data. Well, it's all the data for like eight years from every medical school in the nation. <clears throat> Very impressive. But it just goes to show that, you know, the challenges you face, it really does boil down it boils down to two things. It, it well, yeah, two things. It boils down to who applies, and it, and then who gets admitted. But really, it, who applies is a powerful force. So a little later on this afternoon, we will have a presentation um, by a, a group with CMMP, which is. Uh, uh, medical mon monitoring pro medical monitoring program. It's um, a relatively new organization that provides support to, I think it's both high school and college, but it could be just college for uh, URM folks. And they'll be coming in to talk about what they're doing. Awesome.